Lord Naseby. My Lords, I declare an interest uh, in that I started the all-party British parliamentary group in 1975, currently President, and I've known Sri Lanka for 50 years. I believe the UK has a unique role to play in the future of Sri Lanka. We do need to understand a little bit of the history of that country. In the 11th century, the uh, Tamil Cholas invaded Sri Lanka and took over the north and northeast. Uh, understandably, the Ceylonese were left with the remainder. Then we had colonisation with the Portuguese, Dutch and, of course, the UK. And the British left a very good civil service. Unfortunately, it was not, again, across the two main parties or the two main denominations. It was dominated by the Tamil who uh, looked after the civil service and indeed the professionals. So sadly on independence uh, this position was and they passed the Sinhalese Official Language Act. And there was smoldering, smoldering resentment from 48 right through to around 73. You've got Tamil youth being activated by two people in particular. Uh, one Mr Balasingham, a British citizen uh, after Mr Blair's government gave him that and a man called Prabhakam, a single-minded, ruthless activist. And in 1973, Prabhakam killed the mayor of Jaffna, along with six soldiers. They were brought to Colombo. There was youth re re response and resentment from the youth of the Sinhalese. And very, very sadly, a curfew was not brought in for three days, and well over a 1,000 Tamils were killed. And from, from then onwards, it's really a situation of Elam on the one side, the independent state versus the unitary state of Sri Lanka. We fast forward to May the 18th, 2009. Tamil Tiger terrorists are defeated in a military situation and nearly 30 years of peace have come back. Oh, rather, after 30 years of war, there is peace across the whole island and as there is today. That was followed by a presidential election in January 2015 a coalition government. The platform of that government was to achieve reconciliation, ensure a durable peace, promote and protect human rights, upholding the rule of law and strengthening good governments and democracy. And out of that flowed the UN Resolution 30-1 of the 1st of October. I visited Sri Lanka in February of this year and eight months on it's quite clear to me from the context I have that the government is addressing all the issues that are raised in the UN resolution. It may be taking a little bit longer than some would wish, but uh, that's life, I think. i just highlight three, though. Missing persons. A massive amount of time and effort that was put in by the Panagama Commission, set up by the previous Rajapaksi government, identifying 20,000 missing persons and actually following up 10,000 of them. And to this can be added the superb work done by the ICRC the good news is that a commissioner and a department are now set up. And in passing, I do pay tribute to the enormous hard work put in by Sir Desmond de Silva and his two colleagues. Uh, Sri Lanka must be eternally grateful that men of their wisdom and experience actually got this task moving in the first place. Prevention of terrorism. There is an acceptance that a new act is needed. There was in February. And personally, I cannot understand why it's taking quite so long to get it on the statute. The constitution is being debated, and the good news is that the leading Tamil party is actively taking part in it, and also they are addressing the problem of devolution. Um, I think the West, though, does need to understand that the East cannot necessarily produce a mirror image of a Western structure. And in passing, I pay considerable tribute to HALO for their Sri Lankan operatives clearing a metre, a square metre a day of ground along with the Indians, Canadians and the Sri Lankan army, which makes it possible for families to return to the land. What is not on track and needs urgent attention are the war crimes allegations hanging over the country. These flow from the Dar es Salaam report, which, on a best guess, guess basis, two years after the end of the war, said, and I quote, there is still no reliable figure for civilian deaths. But then they guessed at 40,000. This is the figure that's bandied about by virtually every single human rights organisation, thousands of Tamil diaspora throughout the world, many of whom were LTT Tamil Tiger supporters and still are, 
inflamed by Tamil Net and, of course, those ghastly Channel 4 Killing Fields films, which so influenced the last Prime Minister. I have discovered an unpublished report from the United Nations country team which stated that from August 2009, the civilians killed were 7,721. The war ended six days later, so they can't possibly have got up to 40,000. Uh, then I looked at what Gordon Weiss, the former UN spokesman, uh, says. He produced an estimate in 2009 of 7,000 civilian deaths. And he also made the simple observation, for the Sri Lankan army it makes no tactical sense to kill civilians. The University Tutors for Human Rights, not exactly a right-wing organisation, in fact probably on the far left, had similar figures, and they commented, from what happened we cannot say that the purpose of bombing or shelling by government forces was to kill civilians. Ground troops took great uh, trouble not to harm civilians. The government's own census department, which is a very, very genuine department, did an in-depth census leading to the conclusion that seven to 8,000 were missing. The US Ambassador Blake states on the 7th of April deaths of 4,164 from Jan 20 to April 6. Major General Holmes in his expert military report of March 15 concurs with seven to 8,000. Above all, there was no policy to kill civilians, in fact the opposite. To these I add the British Defence Attaché, Lieutenant Colonel Anton Gash, who said to me in January 2009 he was surprised at the controlled discipline and success of the Sri Lankan army, and in particular the care they were taking to encourage civilians to escape, how well they were looked after, and certainly there was no policy to kill civilians. There couldn't be a better military man, knowledgeable, independent, authoritative of what happened than what he reports in his dispatches. So I decided to ask a Freedom of Information submission to the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office concerning those dispatches in the period Jan 1 to May 19, 2009. The original submission went in on the 6th of November, rejected. Two appeals to higher authorities at the Foreign Office, rejected. So I appealed to the Information Commissioner. More success. He listened. And as a result of his uh, representations, 26 pages of heavily redacted dispatches were sent to me. I looked at them in some care, obviously. I challenged the lack of dispatches in the last two months. Amazingly, another 12 pages appeared at oh. the lack of the dispatches in the last four, few days. I made a final appeal to the first tier tribunal assisted by my very good friend Amal Abawabna. We had the sympathy of the judges for the cause, but they accepted the Foreign Office view that uh, if co confidential information was given out, then nobody in the future would give us any more. So, my lords, I now have the princely sum of 39 pages of heavily redacted uh, dispatches. But nevertheless, like in life, if you dig deeply, you find some real gems. I just quote from four. Jan 28, it is not possible to distinguish civilians from LTTE carders, as few are in uniform. February 16, IDPs being cared for in Trincomalee, welfare appear to be overriding security considerations. Jan 20, no, cl no cluster munitions are being used. April 26, civilians killed February 1 to April 26, 6,400. And 32. My Lords, I hope and pray as a result of this debate that the UK will recognise the truth that no one in the Sri Lanka did to kill Tamil civilians. Furthermore, in my judgment, the UK must now get... And on top of that, I think the UK must recognise that this was a war against terrorism, so the rules of engagement are international humanitarian law and not the European Convention on Human Rights. I think too that uh, the West, and in particular the US and the UK, must remove the threat of war crimes and foreign judges that overhangs and overshadows all Sri Lankans, and especially their leaders. I think they too, or we in the UK, should reflect on the sacrifices of the thousands of young Sri Lankan soldiers who died to create peace in that country. And finally, I reflect, 
Sri Lanka came to our need in two world wars and had casualties. Sri Lanka was one of just a handful of countries who supported us, the UK, over the Falklands. I believe now 